If you wish to love, you must learn to see again. And if you wish to see, you must give up your drug. As simple as that. Give up your dependence. You must tear away from your being the tentacles of society that have penetrated to the marrow. You must drop out. Externally, everything will go on before. You will continue to be in the world, but will no longer be of it. Because in your heart, you will now be free at last and utterly alone. It is only in this aloneness, in this utter solitude, that dependence on your drug will die. Incidentally, aloneness means not not having the company of people. It means not depending emotionally anymore. This For this aloneness, you don't go to the desert. You're right in the middle of people. You're enjoying them immensely. But they no longer have the power to make you happy or miserable. That's what aloneness means. So, in this solitude, your dependence dies and the capacity to love is born. For one no longer sees others as means of satisfying one's addiction. Only someone who has attempted this knows the terror of the process. It is like inviting yourself to die. It is like asking the poor drug addict to give up the only happiness he has ever known and to replace it with the taste for bread and fruit and the clean, fresh morning air and the sweetness of the water from the mountain stream. While he is struggling with his withdrawal symptoms and with the emptiness that he experiences within himself now that his drug has gone, To his fevered mind, nothing can fill the emptiness except his drug. Can you imagine a life in which you refuse to enjoy, to take pleasure in a single word of approval and appreciation? Or to rest your head on anyone's shoulder for support? A life in which you depend on no one emotionally, so no one has the power to make you happy or miserable anymore. You refuse to need any particular person or to be special to anyone or to tell any, to call anyone your own. Even the birds of the air have their nests and the foxes their holes. But you will have nowhere to rest your head in your journey through life. If you ever get to this stage, you will at last know what it means to see with a vision that is clear and unclouded by fear or desire. Every word there is measured. To see at last with a vision that is clear and unclouded by fear or by desire. And you will know what it means to love. But to come to the land of love, you must pass through the pains of death. For to love persons means to have died to the need for persons and to be utterly alone. How would you ever get there? By a ceaseless awareness, by the infinite patience and compassion that you would have for a drug addict, by developing a taste for the good things of life, to counter the craving for your drug. What good things? The love of work which you enjoy doing for love of itself, 
the love of laughter and intimacy with people to whom you do not cling and on whom you do not depend emotionally, but whose company you enjoy. It will also help if you undertake activities that you can do with your whole being. I just said that. Activities that you so love to do that while you are engaged in them, success or recognition or approval simply do not mean a thing to you. It will help too if you return to nature. Send the crowds away. Go up into the mountains and silently commune with trees and flowers and animals and birds, with sea and clouds and sky and stars. Remember I told you yesterday what a spiritual exercise it is to gaze at things, to be aware of things around you. Hopefully, the word will drop the concept will drop and you will see and you will make contact with reality. That is the cure for loneliness. Generally, we seek to cure our loneliness through emotional dependence on people and through gregariousness and noise. That is no cure. Get back to things. Get back to nature. Go up into the mountains. Then you will know that your heart has brought you into the vast desert of solitude. There is no one there at your side. Absolutely no one. At first, this will seem unbearable. But it is only because you are unaccustomed to aloneness. But if you manage to stay there for a while, the desert will suddenly blossom into love. Your heart will burst into song. And it will be springtime forever. It really will. The drug is out. You're free. Then you will understand, my dears, what freedom is, what love is, what happiness is, what reality is, what truth is, what God is. You will see, you will know, beyond those concepts, beyond your conditioning, beyond your addictions and your attachments. Does that make sense? Let me end this with a lovely story. There was a guy who invented the art of making fire. So he took these tools with him and went to a tribe up in the north where it is very cold, bitterly cold. And he taught the people how to make fire. The people were interested. And he showed them the uses to which he could put, you could put fire to. You could cook. You could keep yourself warm, etc. My, they were so grateful. They learnt the art of making fire, but before they could express their gratitude to the man, he disappeared. He wasn't concerned about getting their recognition or their gratitude. He was concerned about their well-being. And he went to another tribe, where again he began to show them the value of his invention. And people were interested there too, a bit too interested for the peace of mind of their priests, who began to notice that this man was drawing the crowds and they were losing their popularity. So they decided to make away with him, which they did. They poisoned him. They got rid of him. They stoned him. They crucified him. Put it any way you like. But, they were afraid now that the people might turn against them. So they were very wily. You know what they did? They had a portrait made of the man. And they mounted it upon the main altar in the temple. 
and those instruments for making fire were placed there in front of the portrait and people were taught to revere the portrait and to pay reverence to those instruments of fire, which they dutifully did for centuries. The veneration and the worship went on, but there was no fire. Where's the fire? Very religious. Where's the fire? Where's the love? Where's the drug uprooted from your system? Where's the freedom? This is what spirituality, this is what religion is all about. Tragically, we tend to lose sight of it, don't we? This is what Jesus Christ is all about. But then, we overemphasize the Lord, Lord, didn't we? Where's the fire? And if worship isn't leading to the fire, if adoration isn't leading to love, if the liturgy isn't leading to clearer perception of reality, if God isn't leading to light, of what use is it? Except to create more divisions, more fanaticism, more antagonisms, etc. And so awareness. It is not from lack of religion in the ordinary sense of the word that the world is suffering, and you know that. It is from lack of love. Lack of awareness. And love is generated through awareness. No other way. No other way. When the heart is unobstructed, the result is love. When the mind is unobstructed, the result is wisdom. Understand the obstruction and it will drop. Understand the obstacles you are putting to the way of love and freedom and happiness, and they will drop. Turn on the light of awareness, and the darkness will disappear. Happiness is not something you acquire. Love is not something that you produce. Love is not something that you have. Love is something that has you. You do not have the wind and the stars and the rain. You don't possess these things. You surrender. And surrender occurs when you are aware of your illusions, when you are aware of your addictions, when you are aware of your desires and fears. And so I told you this morning, first, psychological insight. That's a great help. Not, as I will tell you at the end of this lecture, not analysis. Analysis is paralysis. And I'll explain that to you. Insight isn't necessarily analysis. One of your great American therapists put it very well. He said it is the aha experience. Merely analyzing me gives me no help. It just gives me information. But if you could produce the aha experience, that's insight. That is change. Then, the understanding of your addiction. You need time. Alas, so much time that is given to worship and to singing praises and to singing psalms could so fruitfully be employed in self-understanding. Community, my dears, is not produced by joint liturgical celebrations. You know deep down in your heart and so do I, that they only serve to paper over differences. Community is created by understanding the blocks that we put to community, by understanding the conflicts that arise from our fears and our desires. Then community arises. We must always beware of making worship yet another distraction from the important business of living. And living doesn't mean working in the foreign ministry, as we call it in India, or working in government, or being a big businessman, or doing great acts of charity. That isn't living. Living is to have dropped all the impediments and to live in present moment 
freshness. Look at the birds of the air. They do not toil and spin. That is living. Come alive. You're dead. I began by saying people are asleep. People are dead. Dead people running governments. Dead people doing big business. Dead people educating others. Come alive. Now, worship must help this. Or else it's useless. And increasingly, you know this and so do I. We lo we're losing the youth everywhere. They see this. They're not interested. They're not interested in having more fears and more guilt laid on them. They're not interested in more sermons and exhortations. But they are interested in, how can I love? Of course they are. How can I be happy? How can I live? How can I taste these marvelous things that the mystics tell us? So that's the second thing. Understanding. Third. Don't identify. Somebody asked me as I was coming up to the hall this afternoon. Do you ever feel low? <laughs> Boy, do I feel low. I certainly do every now and then. I get my attacks of low feelings. But you know, they don't last. They really don't. What do you do? I told you. I gave you a four-point program. Put it into action and see the results. It's miraculous. Don't identify. Here comes the low feeling. All right. Well, low. Feeling low. Instead of getting tense about it, instead of getting irritated with yourself about it, understand. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling disappointed or whatever. Second step. The feeling is in me. Not in the other guy. Not in the person who didn't write me that letter. Not in, it's not in the exterior world. It's in me. You know what that understanding alone does for you? Try it out. It's miraculous. When I suddenly realize that it's in me, it's not outside. Because you know, as long as I think it's outside, I feel justified in holding on to my feelings. Anybody would, no, no, anybody wouldn't feel this way. Only idiotic people feel this way. Only sleeping people do. Third, don't identify with the feeling. I is not that feeling. I am not lonely. I am not depressed. I am not disappointed. Disappointment is there. One watches it. You'd be amazed how quickly it glides away. Anything you're aware of keeps changing. The clouds keep moving. As you do this, you also get all kinds of lovely insights into why they were coming there in the first place. Strange but true. I'm a therapist, you know. You don't even need to keep delving into your past anymore. You're able to cope with them right here in the present those feelings. Another understanding, so the I and the me, yet another thing that I would recommend, and it is that you would understand that most of our evils arise from violence to ourselves, self-dissatisfaction. I've got a lovely, lovely quote for you, uh, a few sentences that I would write in letters of gold that I picked up from this book, Summerhill, written by this guy, Neil. Listen to this. Uh, I must give you the background. You probably know he was a man who was in education for 40 years. He developed this kind of maverick school where he took in these boys and girls and he just left them free. That's all. You're free to do whatever you want. You want to learn to read and write, fine. You don't want to learn to read and write, fine. You can do anything you want with your life, provided you don't interfere with the freedom of someone else. Don't interfere in someone else's freedom. Otherwise, you're free. He says, uh, the worst ones were the ones who came to me from convent schools. These were in the old days, of course, but the convent schools. He said it took them about six months to get over all the anger and the resentment that they had repressed. 
So they'd be six months a rebelling, fighting the system. He says, the girl who had the record uh, would take a cycle and for six months would be cycling in town, avoiding class, avoiding school, avoiding everything. Once they got over their rebellion, everybody wanted to learn. Everybody was protesting. Why don't we have class today? Everybody was interested. But they would take what they were interested in. They'd be transformed. Amazing. Unbelievable. Incredible. Transformed. Parents were frightened to send their children to the, this school in the beginning because they said, how could you bring them up if you don't discipline them? And you got to teach them, you got to guide them, you can't leave them free, etc., etc. Oh, you must read that book. It was, it created a revolution in my life. Summerhill, A.S. Neil, N-E-I-L. I'm not sure if it's a double L now. It's A-N-E-I-L-L. A.S. Neil. Summerhill. Paperback. You find it everywhere. Now, what was the secret of his success? He'd be getting, so to speak, the worst kind of kids. The kids that everybody had despaired of. And within six months, they were all transformed. Listen to what he says. Extraordinary words. Holy words. That's a holy book. He says, every child has God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Children come to my school, little devils, hating the world, destructive, unmannerly, lying, Thieving, bad tempered. In six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. These are amazing words coming from a man who has this school of his in Britain that is regularly inspected by people coming from the Ministry of Education and by any headmaster or headmistress or anyone who cared to go there. Amazing. Well, it was his charism. You don't do this kind of thing from a blueprint. You've got to be a special kind of person. He says in some of his lectures to headmasters and headmistresses, he said, come on into Summerhill and you'll find that all the fruit trees are laden with fruit. Nobody's taking the fruits off the trees. No desire to attack authority. The well-fed, and they don't feel any desire to attack authority. There's no resentment and anger. Come to Summerhill, and you'll never find a handicapped child with a nickname. You know how cruel kids can be when someone stammers? He says, you'll never find anyone needling a stammerer. Never. There's no violence in those kids. You know why? No one's practicing violence on them. That's why. Listen to these words of revelation. Sacred words. There's no violence in those kids. Do you know why? Because no one has practiced violence on them. That's why. You know something else? We have peoples in the world who are like this. No matter what your scholars and priests tell you. And your theologians. There are and have been people where there has been no quarrels, no jealousies, no conflicts, no wars, no enmities. None. They exist in my country. Oh, I'm sad to say they existed till relatively recently. I've had friends of mine, Jesuits, go out to work, live and work among people who they assured me are incapable of stealing or lying. They cannot. One sister said to me that when she went to the northeast of India to work among some tribes there, uh, the, the Mizos, uh, Meghalaya, in Meghalaya, up there in the northeast of India. He, she said, you know, when we first went there 40 years ago, the people would lock up nothing. Nothing was ever locked up. Nothing was ever stolen. And they never told lies until the Indian government officials and the missionaries showed up. She said both. That's important to understand. We went there to reform them, to change them, to mold them. 
Every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Now you try to figure that one out. Why would this be? You know, there is that, uh, I can't resist telling you this. Cameras or no cameras. Listen to this. There is uh, that lovely Italian film of Fellini, I think, Eight and a Half. Now, I haven't seen it, but I read a book about it. And this guy describes a scene. In that scene, there's a Christian brother who's going out for a picnic or an excursion with a group of kids, I guess eight to ten-year-old kids, boys. And uh, they're on the beach. And this group of kids moves right on ahead while the brother comes and brings up the, the rear guard kind of with three or four kids with him. Now these boys go on ahead and they come across an old woman who's a whore. And they say to her, hi. And she says, hi. And they say, who are you? And she says, I'm a prostitute. They don't know what that is, but they pretend they do. And then they ask uh, one of the one of the guys who seems a bit more knowing than the others, he says a prostitute is a woman who does certain things uh, if you pay her. They say, would she do those things if we paid her? He said, yeah, why not? So they make a little collection, it seems, and they give her the money. And they say, would you do uh, certain things now that we've given you the money? She says, Hi, yeah, sure, kids. What do you want me to do? Now, the only thing that occurs to the kids is, take your clothes off. So she does. Well, they look at that. Never seen it before. <laughs> now they want to, uh, they don't know what else to do. They say, would you dance? She said, sure. So they all gather around and they're singing and clapping. And the old, the old whore is, you know, kind of uh, moving her, her, her high end and so on. And they're enjoying themselves immensely. Now the brother sees that. He comes staring down the beach. He breaks into the circle. He yells at the woman. He gets her to put her clothes on. And the author says, at that minute, the kids have been spoiled. Till then, they were innocent and beautiful. He spoiled them. I have a rather conservative missionary in India, a Jesuit brother of mine, who, well, not a blood brother, you understand, brother because Jesuit, who came to a workshop of mine, something like this, and I developed this theme over two days. Oh, he suffered. He came to me at the end of the second day at night, and he said, Tony, I can't explain to you how much I'm suffering. Here, listening to you. I said, why, Stan? He said, you know, you're reviving within me a question that I've suppressed for 25 years. It's a horrible question. And I said, what is it? And he said, again and again, I have asked myself, have I not spoiled my people by making them Christian? He's none of your liberals. He isn't one of your liberals, by the way. He's an orthodox, pious, devout, conservative man. Have I not spoiled them by making them Christian? They were a happy, loving, simple, guileless people. Till I got there. You know the story of the American missioners who went to the, the South Sea Island with their wives, Protestant missioners? They were horrified to see these women coming bare-breasted to church. And they insisted with their husbands that the women should be more decently dressed so then they gave them shirts to wear, uh, to put shirts on, I, I guess, so they could give their own hang-ups to the natives. Well, next Sunday, the, the women showed up with their shirts and two big holes cut out for <laughs> comfort. Ah, yeah, for greater comfort, you understand. Ventilation, it's like this. They were all right. It's the missioners who were all wrong. They were all right. You read that book, Papillon? Papillon, the, all right. You know, I wouldn't have believed a word of what that man was saying if I hadn't read studies in certain tribes. Not all tribes, unfortunately. Lots of tribes are very cruel and very inhuman. But you do run into places. Saw that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Something like that. But what about progress, they say to me? To which I reply, progress? 
What are you talking about? You're talking about jumbo jets and putting people in space and star wars? You call that progress? Progress is love progress, idiot. Heart progress, idiot. That's what progress is. Did you forget that? Are we more loving? That's progress. Not have we created vehicles of greater speed and precision. That's not progress. So there it is. You know where, oh my goodness, I was, I was reading Neil to you. I'm so sorry I got carried away. <laughs> he says in six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. These kids are not tribals. They're coming from so-called civilized society whose parents were civilized barbarians. And they're the victims of these barbarians and this barbaric society, which has imposed all kinds of things on these poor kids. Well, in six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. And now get ready for a shock. And I am no genius, says Neil. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. How about that, huh? How about original sin, huh? How about the born evil, huh? Every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. So I am no genius. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. I let them form their own values. And the values are invariably good and social. Can you believe that? When a kid feels love, which means when a kid feels you're on his side, you're on her side, she's okay. The kid doesn't experience any violence anymore. No fear, so no violence. Loving. The kid begins to treat others the way he or she has been treated. Understandably. You've got to read that book. You can make your Bible meditations on that. It's a holy book. It really is. Read it. It revolutionized my life. It revolutionized my dealings with people. And the miracles I began to see. It revolutionized my dealings with me. I began to understand all the self-dissatisfaction that had been ingrained into me. The competition, the comparison, the go on, you've got to improve, that's not enough, etc., etc., etc. And you mean, if they hadn't pushed me, I wouldn't have been what I am? Did I need all that pushing? And anyway, who wants to be what I am? I want to be happy. I want to be holy. I want to be loving. I want to be at peace. I want to be free. I want to be human. All right. And then he adds, the religion that makes people good also makes people bad. But the religion knows, known as freedom makes all people good. For it, for it destroys the conflict that makes people bad. The self-conflict. The religion known as freedom makes them all good. For it destroys that self-conflict that makes them bad. Do you know where wars come from? They come from self-conflict. We're projecting outside of us the conflict that is inside. Show me an individual in whom there is no inner self-conflict, and I'll show you an individual in whom there is no violence. There'll be effective action. There'll be hard action. There is no hatred. There's only understanding. When he or she acts, they act as the surgeon acts. When he or she acts, they act as a loving teacher acts with mentally retarded people or children or whatever. You don't blame them. You understand, but you swing into action. But when you swing into action with your own hatred and your own violence, well, you've compounded the error. You're trying to put fire out with more fire. You're trying to deal with a flood by adding water to it. 
So, every child has a God in him. Our attempts to mold the child will turn the God into a devil. Children come to my school little devils, hating the world, destructive, unmannerly, lying, thieving, bad-tempered. In six months, they are happy, healthy children who do no evil. And I am no genius. I am merely a man who refuses to guide the steps of children. I let them form their own values. And the values are invariably good and social. The religion that makes people good makes people bad. But the religion known as freedom makes all people good, for it destroys the inner conflict. I've added the word inner. That makes people devil. He has a, he has a horrible statement. He says, the first thing I do when a child comes to Summerhill is destroy its conscience. Would you believe that? The first thing I do when a child comes to Summerhill is destroy its conscience. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, at least I assume he's talking about it, because I know what he's talking about. You don't need conscience. When you get consciousness, you don't need conscience. When you have sensitivity, you don't need a conscience. You're not violent. You're not fearful. And you think, this must be an unattainable ideal. Well, read that book. And I have run into an individual here or two, here or there, who suddenly stumbles upon this and knows. So that's one more thing you must understand. The root of the evil within you. As you begin to understand this, you stop making demands on yourself. You stop have making, having expectations of yourself. You stop pushing yourself. And you understand. Gee, that would take us 20 days to comment on. But you've got the kernel. You've got the seed. You can develop it. There's one last thing I have to say, and it is this. You know, connected with change through awareness. The last thing is, what I insinuated in that meditation that I read to you, and it is this. Nourish yourself on wholesome food. Good, wholesome food. And I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about sunsets, about nature, about a good movie, about a good book, about enjoyable work, about good company. And hopefully you will break your addiction to those other feelings. Just think, what kind of feeling comes upon you when you're in touch with nature? Or when you're absorbed in your work that you love? Or when you're really conversing with someone whose company you enjoy in openness and intimacy without clinging? What kind of feelings do you have? Compare those feelings with the feelings that come when you win an argument or you won a race or you become popular, or everybody's applauding you. A different type of feeling. Those feelings I call worldly feelings. The other feelings I call soul feeling. Lots of people gain the world and lose their soul. Lots of people live empty soulless lives because they're feeding themselves on popularity, on appreciation, on praise, on I'm okay, you're okay, on look at me, attend to me, support me, value me, on being the boss, on having power, on winning the race. You feed yourself on that, you're dead. You've lost your soul. Feed yourself on other, more nourishing material. Then you'll see the transformation. 